Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the EAU webinar about diagnosis and management of upper tract trauma. My name is Noam Kitri from Israel, and I am happy to tell you that we have many attendees online in this webinar. I have no relevant conflict of interest to declare. This webinar is based on the current EAU guidelines for urological trauma. It is the first about this topic, and hopefully it will be followed by another webinar regarding lower tract trauma. Here you can see the names of the Eurotrauma Guidelines panel members. We currently have uh, five urologists and one radiologist, interventional radiologist, uh, and the trauma guidelines are updated every year with an annual scope search of all relevant literature. The guidelines undergo major update every two to three years in order to make them as clear and as concise as possible. When writing trauma guidelines, we are facing major limitations and obstacles. Because of relatively low incidence and historically low funding, the majority of our records are case reports and small series. There are almost no randomized control trials and no high quality evidence. Therefore, many recommendations are made by expert consensus. And here we have some of these distinguished experts with us today to this webinar. You can see here the program for this webinar. We'll start a presentation by Dr. Ephraim Serafetinidis from Athens, Greece, and he will talk about evaluation and imaging for renal trauma. It will be followed by a presentation by Mr. Davindra Sharma from London, UK, who will talk about management of renal trauma. After these two presentations, we'll open the discussion and question and A. You're uh, invited to send questions in the Q&A section of the webinar. Afterwards, after this short interval, Dr. Felix Campos from Santander, Spain, will talk about urotel trauma, prevention strategies, and surgical treatment. A short Q&A will follow. Just a quick word about trauma. Trauma is a disease and a major public health uh, problem. It is a predictable, it is preventable, and it is treatable. Every year, more than 5 million deaths per year from trauma around the world, and millions more are injured. Trauma is the leading cause of death for individuals up to 45 years of age, and it's the fourth leading cause of death overall of all ages. Trauma can be intentional from violence, conflicts, war, etc. It can be unintentional from motor vehicle accidents from falls or iatrogenic. It can be either blunt or penetrating. It can be blast injury. And due to lack of time, we're not going to discuss the general principles of trauma management, but I just wanted to emphasize that the main goal is obviously to save life and to minimize morbidity. Centralization of trauma care and multidisciplinary teamwork, teamwork is crucial in order to, to reach these goals. The urologist is part of this team and have to understand his role. So without further delay, we will ask Dr. Serafeditis to start his presentation about renal trauma. Thank you. Dear fellows, I am Ephraim Serafeditis from Athens, Greece, and in the following minutes, I will share with you some data and ideas regarding the evaluation and imaging of adult trauma patients with suspected non iatrogenic renal injuries. I have no potential conflict of interest regarding this presentation. The following presentation is based on the current guidelines of the European Association of Urology on Urogenital Trauma. Primary evaluation of the trauma patient starts as soon as he receives my emergency unit personnel at the site of the accident. Response time and communication with the trauma center are important factors. Depending on pre-hospital care protocols, evaluation at the site of the accident may include ALS and the reporting type of injuries, polytrauma, blunt, or penetrating to the hospital. Depending on the level of the medical unit and the national protocols, the evaluation of the trauma patient is carried out by the emergency department personnel. The presence of urologists depends on department's protocol. 
in some departments, an ultrasound unit is available on site and the trauma patient can be scanned as soon as he arrives. The principles of ATLS are universal and adopted by all emergency departments. If a trauma patient is hemodynamically unstable, resuscitation is the first priority. If the unstable patient does not respond to resuscitation efforts, an immediate intervention is mandatory. A simultaneous overview can reveal signs suggestive of upper urinary tract injury as a penetrating injury to the torso or fractures to the lower ribs. Hematuria is a serious sign, but it is not specific for injury of the upper urinary tract. The personnel from the unit that transferred the patient can provide useful information about the accident. History from the patient or relatives must focus on past renal surgery, pathology, and medication. Anticoagulants have a negative impact on the progress of blood loss. During physical examination, clinical findings suggestive of possible renal injury are flank bruising, stab wounds, bullet entry or exit wounds to the abdomen and thorax, as well as abdominal tenderness. For analysis, hematocrit and baseline creatinine are required. Hematuria, visible or non-visible, is the key finding. However, major injury such as disruption of the ureteropelvic junction, pedicle injury, segmental arterial thrombosis, and stab wounds may have not hematuria. Hematuria that is out of proportion to the history of trauma may suggest pre-existing pathology. Urin diphtake quickly evaluates for hematuria, but false negative results can range from 3 to 10%. An increased creatinine level usually reflects pre-existing renal pathology. Radiographic assessment is the key in the evaluation of patients with suspected renal injuries, since it is the most reliable way to identify and classify all injuries. Of course, every emergency department is following its own protocol. However, experience and retrospective studies suggest that focus assessment sonography in trauma, FAST, is unreliable for upper urinary tract injuries. On the other hand, CT scan is best and fastest modality for reliable classification of all injuries. Especially in stable patients with visible hematuria, CT scan with IV contrast will reveal all renal, parenchymal, and vessel injuries. Delayed phase imaging is important for collective system injuries. Absolute indications for CT imaging are the following. Visible hematuria after place in a catheter, polytrauma, non-visible hematuria and one episode of hypotension, history of rapid acceleration injury and or significant associated injuries, penetrating trauma, clinical signs suggesting renal trauma. The goals of imaging are to create renal injury, document pre-existing path renal pathology, and demonstrate presence and function of the contralateral kidney and identify injuries to other organs. When CT is unavailable, we need to rely on ultrasonography, but always remember that the method is insensitive, operator and software dependent, does not define the injury well, but on the other hand remains a good option for follow-up. IVP was the method of choice before the CT scan and can provide vital information that is time consuming. One shot intraoperative IVP can confirm the presence of a functioning contralateral kidney in patients too unstable to have preoperative imaging. The most accepted system for classification of renal injuries is the one proposed by the American Association for Surgery of Trauma in 1989. It was updated in 2018 and remains the best tool since it provides a common language for understanding each other and has a proved prognostic value. Grade one and two injuries are not considered clinically important. Grade three is still considered a low-grade injury unless there are injuries from other organs. Grade four parenchymal injuries are defined as lacerations extending into the collecting system. Vessel injuries are more threatening since bleeding is beyond gerota's fascia. Grade five injuries are the most threatening and commonly the associated injuries are severe. The vessel injuries are often associated with hemodynamic instability.
The recommendations for the evaluation of the trauma patients with suspect renal injuries are well supported by practice and literature worldwide. The primary concern is to assess hemodynamic stability upon admission, then take a detailed history if possible and test for hematuria and blood loss, and finally perform a multi-phase computed tomography scan in patients with major injuries and or visible hematuria. Thank you. We'll go to Dr. Sharma's uh, presentation now about management of renal trauma. Hello, Devendra Sharma, consultant neurologist, presenting on renal trauma. I have no conflict of interest to declare. Our objectives in managing trauma are clearly to save the patient's life. If we follow the top two principles of hemorrhage control and minimizing contamination, this will result in preservation of organ and function and minimize morbidity. Let's keep those principles in mind. Hemodynamic stability is the primary, primary criterion for the management of renal injuries. We get the information from the clinical assessment and the response to resuscitation. Once we have the clinical information, look at the way of defining the injury by cross-sectional imaging, and this is by CT. Here's a great CT coronal image showing a laceration to the left renal, left kidney via penetrating injury to the loin. Imaging will allow us to stage the injury with by grade and recognize pre-existing pathology, document function of the contralateral kidney, identify associated injuries, and more importantly, differentiate which injuries require early intervention or intervention at all. The standard grading system, one to five, the top part of the slide is the grade one, two, and three injuries, which are almost all managed conservatively. And the bottom four and five, the higher grade injuries, which require a little bit more thought and consideration. Once we have our clinical assessment and our radiological staging and grade, we can decide on the management options. This will be influenced by local resources, mechanism of injury and associated injuries. A simple line diagram, stable patients going primarily towards conservative management, and these are the lower grades of injury. On stable patients, the higher grades of injury going towards an intervention more and more minimally invasive. A little bit of terminology, operative management is clearly surgery by renorophy or nephrectomy, non-operative management divided into conservative, where no intervention is done, but careful observation is obviously a part of the management. Minimally invasive, which is also non-operative, involves things like embolization, uteric stenting, and percutaneous drainage. 2018 classification update to represent the type of management we're offering in the modern trauma setting. One and two, no great difference. Subcapsular hematoma, contusion in grade one, grade two being a, 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 a shallow laceration, less than one, one centimeter, grade three being a laceration uh, deeper, all with hematoma confined to gerotus fascia. Interesting thing about grade three is now there's an, any injury in the presence of a kidney vascular injury, which I interpret as being an AV fistula or a pseudoaneurysm. Lovely article with lovely pictures, and I recommend reading this one. For grade four, segmental injury has come in. Uh, and this is both segmental vascular injury and segmental infarction, as well as traditional uh, parenchymal injury, including the collecting system. So this is a standard grade four injury with collecting system injury, urine extravasation, managed completely conservative. As, as I said, most of the grade one to fours are managed like that, uh, with the urine settling in time in terms of hematuria, and a follow-up ultrasound pediatric patient showing a, a completely recovered kidney. Segmental infarction in grade four injury is new to the classification highlighted here. We'd had no real way of classifying these injuries before. 
There's no hematoma, but there is infarction and renal loss. This is a lovely uh, angiogram of a segmental arterial injury, grade four, which we were expecting to require embolization, but actually was managed completely conservatively. Complete infarction due to main vessel thrombosis is usually the result of an intimal flap due to a decelerating injury in a high, uh, velocity, a high uh, speed uh, road traffic accident, sudden braking. And this will lead to the complete loss of the kidney if there's no intervention within a half an hour to an hour for ischemic time. Grade five injury is a bit better defined. Of course, there's a, a hilum uh, vascular injury that remains the same, but the shattered kidney is described as a kidney with no identifiable parenchymal renal anatomy. So that's different, there is none. So this is not multiple lacerations into a kidney with some function. This is no function and a severely injured kidney. Classification again. A word on penetrating trauma, uh, we see mainly stab wounds, but obviously gunshot injuries are seen and it's important to recognize that the high velocity injuries, which we won't see much of, will completely destroy a kidney because of the blast and energy transfer effect. And even uh, adjacent injuries can cause contusion to the kidney. What we do see a lot of is penetrating injury and penetration injury to the, to the loin or to the back uh, of the patient. Uh, uh, this line, the anterior axillary line is helpful to distinguish ones that are posterior to ones which are anterior. The posterior ones are unlikely to injure uh, any of the intra-abdominal organs or the hilum of the kidney and tend to be managed more and more conservatively, uh, non-operatively. In this series here from London, we were able to show that in, in over 60 patients, all were managed without surgical intervention. Of course, 10 patients had to have angiography and embolization, and there were laparotomies done for other reasons. We have to be careful managing penetrating trauma and manage it in a multidisciplinary setting. So we have the input of general surgeons, thoracic surgeons, uh, intensive care and radiology, et cetera. You can get very good results with this. This is an example of a penetrating re renal injury managed completely conservatively with good renal preservation. So not operative management appropriate for penetrating trauma. And part of the reason is because of angioembolization being a game changer in successfully being a first-line hemostatic option. Indications, active extravasation of contrast, AV fistula, and pseudoaneurysm. Very good su success rates, particularly in the lower grades of renal trauma. An example of embolization. Just a quick note on inpatient management. What we do in the lower grades of injury is less and less with a plan for early discharge. With the higher grades of injury, management in the ITU setting, antibiotics, bed rest, catheterization, et cetera. And you can structure your management based on grade and clinical assessment. Follow-up imaging again, lower grade, no follow-up imaging, higher grade, yes at around the 48 hour point, repeat CT recommended. And for penetrating injury, certainly CT uh, follow-up recommended. Pre-existing pre renal lesions are interesting because it, the kidney is more susceptible to injury and has higher grade injury. This is a great example a couple of months ago, rugby tackle on a young man, slim young man, developed loin pain, came in with a funny looking kidney, he clearly had a pre-existing PUJ, lots of blood and urine in the retroperitoneum, uh, a percutaneous drain put in, a percutaneous nephrostomy put in, and the patient responding well. Please note that blood and urine in the retroperitoneum makes for patients who don't look well and who can have tachycardias and intermittent spikes. Please hold your nerve and avoid surgical intervention. They usually settle with time. An injury to a transplant kidney, now, arterial injury is, is, is challenging for two reasons. One is that obviously it bleeds a lot, so the patients are unstable. And secondly, you have potential compromise to the kidney. 
and a warm ischemic time problem, right? Uh, for that reason, the best outcomes are with immediate nephrectomy. But if you, if you do have a, a bilateral injury or solitary kidney, repair is recommended, hopefully in very uh, prompt time. Here is interventional radiology stepping up again, attempting to, well, stenting successfully an arterial a thrombosed artery. The kidney was unfortunately lost because of the battle with warm ischemic time. We didn't get there in time. Vascular injury, remember uh, a laceration to the renal vein is effectively a side hole in the inferior vein cava. It bleeds a lot. On the right side, a significant avulsion is probably best tied off and the nephrectomy done on the left side, you can preserve the kidney by tying off the, the avulsion, but relying on the collaterals for the kidney to survive. Classification system again, with the management options. Now a little bit more on the higher grade injuries. The indications for expiration, persistent life-threatening hemorrhage, that's pretty standard. This is actually usually due to renal pedicle avulsion. If at laparotomy, there's an expanding or pulse-style hematoma, again, probably due to pedicle uh, injury, then that's an indication to explore. Try to get early vascular control if you can, if you can get a team to help you. Otherwise, your nephrectomy rates will be high. If you can get proximal control, you can do salvage renorophy or even partial nephrectomy. However, as mentioned, nephrectomy rates are high when you, we explore. Now, what about, we have discussed a fair bit about the renal trauma and particularly towards non-operative treatment. Is there any evidence to support us in high-grade renal injury where the questions are, are lie? We did a systematic review on this in the panel, and at the end, it was published, and the recommendations favored non-operative management. Renal preservation, mortality, and length of stay were better. And we therefore recommended non-operative management as the most appropriate first-line option. Now, the problem with this is that the sicker, more severely injured patients and so on, stable patients tend to go directly to surgical intervention, surgical exploration, and they have the poorer outcomes. So this study is, has a bias in it that doesn't allow us to be, to be dogmatic about this approach. Let's think about one particular case, high-grade penetrating renal trauma, young man, hypotensive, and tachycardia despite resuscitation, CT showing a very badly injured kidney with blood and urine everywhere, bowel hanging out the wound, radiology report quite definitive, and many factors pre predicting surgical intervention, hematoma size, uh, penetrating trauma, contrast ex extravasation, concomitant injuries, and shock. Gather your team, call in all the help you need, uh, you can see the resources required for a case as challenging as this. If possible, get early vascular control, identify the injury, perform your repair. And this patient ended up with about 30% renal function on that side. The European guidelines uh, promotes uh, a package of care uh, a stepwise approach starting with conservative treatment, but considering minimally invasive and surgical exploration if necessary. And this approach has probably resulted in the rate of nephrectomy for high-grade renal injuries decreasing over time. Of course, the logistics of the individual center will govern the decision-making. Uh, a reminder of the management options and the simple line diagram. In conclusion, we define the injury by clinical assessment and CT. We communicate with radiology. We consider non-operative management as a default option. It's successful in the majority of cases. However, deterioration of a patient on a non-operative uh, management pathway 
will lead towards surgical intervention, and this could be at an early stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. So before we go to the questions from the audience, I would like to ask both of you, Ephraim and, and Davendra, uh, about the new classification of the AST. As we all know, as you both described, there are new, there's a new classification system. It is much more elaborated, more complex. And do you think uh, it will going to change the, our recommendation about management? I mean, most of the literature is based on the old classification of the AST. This one is a bit different, not much. Do you think it's going to change the recommendation? Efram. I think that uh, in the last uh, 40 years, the classification system was a tool to communicate and educate. I think that uh, the new classification is more detailed but I don't actually think that in the future, things will change very much. We base our, uh, we make our decisions on the management of the patients, not by the classification of injuries, but by the clinical status and the associated injuries. So uh, we can still use the most detailed, the more detailed new classification, but uh, actually the, decisions on management of the patient are still made on his clinical status. Mr. Sharma. Uh, thank you, Noam. Um, I think it's a great question. Um, I, I think that the classification really has changed to reflect how we manage the patients now. And, you know, I do think, and in my own practice, that I consult a lot with radiology more than I did before to get the finer details of the CT scan, which can be difficult to interpret. And that has led to, to, to me maybe altering my approach to the patient in monitoring. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you well. I do apologize. Um, so, so, I, so I think fundamentally it, it, it will alter some of the decisions we make, but I think Ephraim is right, are right about our clinical assessment is that I think we will find less patients who are um, given a diagnosis of grade five injury because it is so clearly defined. And so when trauma series say that they have very good outcome from grade five, I think we'll find that changes if it, if, because a lot of those are actually grade four injuries and we'll be able to define the management of higher grade injuries better. So those are two points and I do apologize for my connection. Thank you. Ephraim, there's one question from the audience to you. I know that our guidelines do not uh, discuss children, pediatric urology, but there's an, a question about any difference in indication to radiological examination in children? Can you elaborate a bit about it? Yes, I think uh, evaluation of children is uh, a bit uh, different. In uh, children, hemodynamic uh, instability is very rare and uh, we have to be very suspicious on management and uh, evaluation of uh, children with suspected uh, renal injuries. Uh, ultrasound is more uh, is better in assessment of children since it would, it's very difficult to to have a CT scan in an injured child. So uh, I think uh, in, uh, in 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 children it is uh, we have we have to be as I said before more suspicious and. Uh, 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 keep the keep keep the, the injured child under uh, um, we keep it at the emergency department for a longer time in order to evaluate it uh, uh, a couple of times. Thank you, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Sharma. There was a question about stenting the ureter. Uh, 
uh, you were talking about uh, uh, ureteric stenting in uh, uh, urinomas and grade four injuries with, with injury to the collecting system. What are the indications for stenting? Do you stent in every case of ureteric injury, of, of uh, uh, laceration in the collecting system, or you wait for complications such as infection or, uh, or uh, decreased uh, uh, kidney, kidney function? I think it's a very good question, and a lot of it depends on your logistics. Um, my view and the, 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 the patient I showed of a grade four renal injury was not stented, and that patient had quite extensive extravasation of urine. And our standard practice is not to stent people with grade four uh, injuries. Now it becomes a little bit different if the patient is spiking temperatures, has a, uh, has a collection of urine, uh, and then you can, you can make that decision on case by case basis. Uh, the other thing is if the patient has penetrating trauma, I'm more likely to ask for a stent because they have, they, they, they have a hole that is wide and leaking from the kidney. So to get that to heal nicely, getting urine to drain uh, antigradely is better. So generally we don't stent patients with blood trauma and uh, collecting system injury, but in penetrating trauma, we would promote, uh, we would be more supportive of stenting at an early stage. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, one more question for, for Mr. Sharma about the follow-up. Uh, how long do you think you should wait uh, to, do, uh, uh, to keep the patient in bed rest? And uh, is it really necessary to do a follow-up CT scan for every grade four and up injury? Um, another good question. I don't like bed rest in general. I think patients should be mobilized early, but you have to remember that a, a majorly injured kidney can potentially bleed if the clot is dislodged. So for higher grade injuries, grade four and five, I would recommend a, a period of bed rest. And usually these patients are sick anyway, so they're not up, up and about and they have associated injuries. For lower grade injuries, no, early mobilization is fine. Uh, and the second part of that question, Norm, just remind me. The second part was, was about the CT scan. Do you have to do it in, for every patient that has a grade four or five kidney or do you just wait for the clinical situation to, to impair it? I think that's another very good question. My, 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 my take on that is you manage the patient clinically unless there's two things going on. One is penetrating trauma. I think the risks are too high of avoiding things like uh, you know, persistent bleeding potentially, but AVFs and, and pseudoaneurysm. And the second thing is grade five trauma. I think you need to know, have a little bit more information about the patient. But for grade four injuries with just contrast extravasation, I don't, and the patient is well, I don't, I don't often ask for follow-up imaging. Mm -hmm. So you're more conservative about it. Uh, uh, Ephraim, can you tell us a bit about what do you think about uh, scans, DMSA scans, MAG scans, kidney function scans, when to do it, uh, how long after, after the, the injury? What's your, what's your experience about it? I, I will follow uh, the vendors, uh, Mr. Sharma's uh, thoughts from uh, the previous answer. I think before discharging a patient, a trauma patient, we have been very sure, even for legal, not only medical, but for legal uh, reasons, the uh, exact situation of his injured organs. So sometimes a scan is useful, not only to make sure that he's clinically uh, well, but uh, after that, before discharge, he has a functioning injured kidney. So, in in this case, we have to think that uh, in follow up uh, in a traumatized uh, kidney, a DMSA may be useful in a period of three months. Three months is a, it's a good number for for follow up scan for functioning. Yeah, okay. So I think we are ready for, for the presentation about ureteric trauma. Dr. Campos is ready, and we'll follow with a few more questions after his presentation. Thank you. <laughs> 
Good afternoon from Santander. First, I want to thank the SIU for their invitation to participate in this webinar series and to my colleagues in the Itarama guidelines panel for their kind assistance preparing this presentation. Following our schedule, I'm going to perform an update in the guidelines content relative to irreteral trauma. I, I do not have any conflict of interest with the contents of this presentation. And this is how we're going to distribute these 15 minutes. But before starting with the incident and the etiology of the retinal trauma, I must mention again that this presentation is based on the updated 2022 Uretrauma guidelines, which will be released hopefully soon. Compared with what we have seen before in renal trauma, injuries to the ureter are relatively rare, accounting only to 1 to 2.5% of all urinary tract traumas. As you all know, the reason for this is the anatomical protection and elasticity of the ureters. Penetrating external ureteral trauma are mainly to by, by ballistic lesions, while blunt uh, external trauma are common due to high-speed road traffic accidents, but usually are associated with other severe injuries. The modern series account iatrogenic lesions for up to 80% of the all ureteral trauma, and that links with the title of this presentation as we would consider preventing strategies to avoid these lesions. This damage could be by ligation or kinking with sutures, complete or partial transection using sharp instruments, thermal injury to ureteral walls, and ischemic damage due to excessive mobilization or dissection during the surgery of the ureters. And as you may see, some of these mechanics, mechanisms would cause delayed injuries, which should be a problem. This table summarizes the procedure and surgical specialties involved in iatrogenic ureteral traumas. As you may see, gynecological operations are the most common causes, with hysterectomy being the most frequent procedure involved. And here, it is worth mentioning that recent series suggest that the laparoscopic or robotic approach for hysterectomy may do not have any impact reducing the rate of irretrieval injuries compared with the open approach. And this is in contrast uh, to the urological and colorectal surgeries, because um, such operations have decreased the percentage of irretrieval injuries over the last 20 years. And this is related with improvements in technique, instrument, and surgical experience, namely the learning curve of laparoscopic and robotic approaches, which were responsible for this significant change, reducing the rate of urethral injury in these two specialities, urological and colorectal operations. And I would also mention the endoscopic urethral procedures as a common source for urethral trauma, especially because there is a large number of ureteroscopies performed every year worldwide. And certainly, ureteroscopy is a safe procedure, but in some series, post ureteroscopic injuries are accounted to up to 71% of all the lesions repaired. Following our schedule, we will review now the diagnosis of these injuries. And since around 2 to 3% of the gunshot in the abdominal area would cause injury to the ureters, this should lead us to suspect ureteral involvement, and commonly in the setting of other vascular or intestinal lesions due to this gunshot. If possible, we should obtain cross-sectional imaging, including computed tomography, urography, to look for contrast extravasation. But usually, the ureteral lesion is have to be diagnosed during the emergency laparotomy if the patient is, is unstable or it should be brought to the operation theater without these imaging techniques. What is not proven useful because it's negative in up to 60% of the cases is the classical one-shot intravenous pyelography, so it should be avoided. Again, also we should consider ureteral checking for the ureteral integrity in high-energy blunt traumas. I mentioned here vehicle accidents, but also falls from height and other high energy impacts are related with these injuries. In this context, the bony structures are also really commonly affected, especially the pelvic ring 
and also the lumbar sacral spinal area. And in these cases, a CT urography is recommended, but if unclear, a retrography urography is indicated for confirmation of this extravasation and confirming this injury. And finally, as a common statement of good practice, we should be aware of the risk of ureteral injury during certain surgical procedures of maneuvers. And also we should check for the integrity if appropriate using in selected cases, some intravenous dye product during the procedure. And why is so important the diagnosis of the ureteral injury intraoperative? Because the indication is conducting an immediate repair unless the patient is critically ill and is not going to able to cope with the procedure. We will mention shortly all the repair options, but it's worth it to emphasize that repairing the ureter in the primary setting is usually easy and has better outcomes, reducing the need for secondary or tertiary procedures compared with the delayed repair. And also, in recent series, it is showing that using the performing the repair using the same minimal invasive approach that the index procedure, which caused the lesion of the ureter, for instance, laparoscopy or robotic approach, has very good outcomes. We're going to move on now to how, if possible, we can prevent these ureteral traumas. And I have just mentioned that we should be aware of the risk of ureteral injury during certain surgical procedures. And therefore, it is important that we also recognize the risk factors for this ureteral injury during this open procedure. And in complicated cases, which according to a large cohort of these injuries is around 4% of these cases, a ureteral stent can be placed preoperative, and we will discuss this shortly. And something new is the use of a retrograde ventilation of endocyanin green that is proven useful to identify the ureters during robotic assisted colorectal surgeries. When considering preoperative stenting, we should know that this is going to help identifying the ureter and identifying possible injuries. But today, there is no evidence that this preoperative stenting decreases the likelihood of such ureteric injuries, but instead is demonstrating that increase in cost on surgical times. And regarding ureteroscopy, some risk factors to high-grade injury are already described, namely the male gender, longer operation time, and longer time to insert the access sheet. Also, in a, a, having a small proximal diameter of the ureter in non-contrast CD is a predictor also for high-risk for high risk injuries. And as recommendation, using the pulse scale may be useful to standardize intraoperatic traumatic findings and a recent randomized controlled trial evidence that using psilodoxin 8 mg for three days before the ureteroscopy reduces significantly high-grade ureteral injury due to the access sheet insertion and also improved postoperative pain after the procedure. Finally, I will finish the presentation with the management strategies for the ureteral traumas. So far, we have already reviewed most of the guidelines recommendations. So now I will focus on the last one. Perform ureteral reconstruction according to the length and of the affected segment. And in the guidelines is included this flowchart, which summarizes the options for repair. In this case, are related with the ureteral structures developed after the injury, but the principles are pretty much the same. In the, in the proximal ureter, if the injury is short, around less than two to three centimeters, it can be managed in most of the cases by performing a primary ureter ureterostomy in a tension-free in a tension free way. Alternative, a ureter calicostomy could be attempted, as you can see in the in the right side of the of the slide, or a transureter ureterostomy. But in this case, you're, we are putting at risk the contralateral renal unit that is usually safe. For the mid ureter, for the mid, mid third of the ureter, also a tension free and stomatic repair is still a good option for short structures, along with uh, again 
the transuretero ureterostomy. Also, they can care with not compromising the contralateral unit. But it's, in these cases, it's also feasible to bridge the defect using a long boari flap from the, from the bladder, are reaching a success rate roughly around 80 to 88% of, of cases. And this long boari could be associated with a downward nephropexy if required in order to lower the kidney and bridge the defect more easily. And finally, in the lower part of the ureter, where most of the iatrogenic injuries happens, the easiest option is performing a tension-free ureteral reimplantation. If the proximal ureter is not reaching nicely the dome of the bladder, we could perform a soat hitch or even a boari flap to shorten the distance and ensure a tension-free reimplantation. And finally, for long ureteral injury, the classical option is using bowel segments to substitute the ureter, either the entire small bowel piece or using the appendix or reconfiguring the, the small bowel uh, like, in, like in, the, in the Monty procedure. Uh, but recently for non-obliterative stricter, which still have some lumen, uh, the ureteral augmentation can be performed using long oral graft and usually wrapping omentum or perirenal fatty tissue in order to support the, the oral graft. Uh, but also we acknowledge that in most series of, of ureteral repairs, uh, there is always a small percentage of patients will, will end up having indwelling nephrostomy tube or JJ stents, or even having to take the, having the, their kidneys removed because they're having continuous infection or they're having troubles. So in order to summarize my talk, I would remember to think about ureteral injuries in traffic accidents or penetrating wounds, and also during pelvic or abdominal interventions. We should be able to evaluate preoperative the theoretical risk for ureteral involvement and also consider pre -estentic, uh, placing a preoperative pre uh, ureteric stent in selected cases, but also if the ureter is damaged, and especially if the ureter is damaged and recognized, we should be able to repair it immediately, which has to be done in a tailor-made way for each patient and lesions. So many thanks for your attention, and hopefully we will have some time for discussion and answering some questions from our audience. Many thanks again. Thank you very much, Dr. Campos, for your clear presentation. I remind the audience that you can ask questions to Dr. Campos. First, I would like to ask you, uh, in your opinion, uh, when you should weigh, when should you stent a ureter prophylactically before an operation? What is your basic recommendation? What's the considerations? The thing is, we need to mm, think that if there is going to be any benefit for the patient on that. So we already mentioned that having the, the stent place is not going to make the rate of injury of this ureter lower but it's going to be make our life easier or the other surgeon, surgeon easy in order to identify the ureter and in order to identify any laceration or any damage to the ureter. So I think that in high rate, uh, we need to balance the, the, the risk for beneficial for, the, for each patient. So in order, uh, patients when you're uh, with having prior radiotherapy, prior, uh, previous major surgery in that area, in cases with anatomical abnormalities that you're not able to see where the ureter is gonna is gonna be, in cases with advanced malignancy where the ureter is gonna be, may be displaced by huge masses, or in cases with previous renal impairment that you can place the the JJ stent in advance in order to prevent any damage to the to the kidney before the before the surgery. But probably there is not a general rule. Um, probably it has to be discussed with the with the surgeon going to perform the surgery. Thank you very much. A few questions from the audience, Dr. Campos. Uh, you have mentioned several management techniques for for a repair of the ureter. Why didn't you mention ureter or ureterostomy for a lower ureteric trauma? <laughs> 
because for the lower ureteric trauma, the outcomes doing a ureteric reimplantation are better than just doing the ureteral ureterostomy. So there is no harm in doing just a new joint with the bladder instead of doing the, a joint between the two ends of the, of the ureter. Probably if you have just a partial damage, probably you just left the, the JJ stent in place and just repair the ureter. But if you have like a complete transection and in any doubt, you, will go, you should go for a, for a reimplantation because it's safer. Because it's safe. Thank you. Another question from the, from the audience. What is the role of retrograde pyelography and stent insertion in case of partial laceration? What's the role of the retrograde? Probably, do you mean for checking? I mean, if you have already placed a JJ stent because you have like a partial laceration, probably makes sense to perform a cystoscopy or a retrograde ureterography uretero, in order to see if there is any leakage and you can remove the, remove the, the stain safely or in order to diagnose it, if you have any, any doubt. But probably just with a, with a nice CT urography should be enough. Should, you should probably, you shouldn't need any intervention with the, with the contract if you perform a nice CT urography. Great. And there's one more question. Uh, we can call it the $1 million question. I think it should be addressed to all of us about the timing of repair. When surgery after damage to ureter after cesarean section, when to do the repair? If you, do, if you, if you uh, identify the ureteric trauma intraoperatively, then you have to try to repair it intraoperatively, obviously. But if you identify the ureteric trauma postoperatively, like one, two, three days afterwards, when is the better, the ideal uh, time to repair the ureter? Mr. Sharma, maybe you would like to ask answer this? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I feel the best time to repair it, of course, is at a time of injury. And uh, we use a sort of a two week margin because some patients obviously are not picked up at the time of injury but may not progress well in the early post-operative period if it's a abdominal surgery or pelvic surgery. So if you pick that up by CT urogram within two weeks, maybe 10 days, I think it's reasonable to go back in and repair that ureter. It avoids a, a long period of recovery and somewhat misery for the patient. However, if you pick the injury up beyond the two-week mark, uh, we, push, we, we prefer to wait for six weeks to let things settle down and then to go in for repair, because it can be quite difficult uh, in that phase, the tissues are quite friable and they break down easily. So um, this is a controversial area. There's not a lot of evidence for it and I'm sure opinions will differ, but that would be my view. Anything to, to elaborate about this, this point, Dr. Campos? No, probably it's, it's related with the, with the state of the patient. Um, probably related with the postoperative from the index procedure. I mean, if it's just a minor procedure, probably if, if the injury was performed transvaginal, probably the reason, if you, if, and if you're planning to go abdominal, probably you don't have to wait that much time. But I think that six weeks is probably the, a reasonable time in order to the inflammatory problem to the process to settle, and then probably you can go, you can go safely at that moment. But there is no rule of that, and there is no, little evidence on that. So nothing especially to add to, to Mr. Sharma comment. Thank you. Dr. Safanitidis, uh, another question about timing. For how long do you think we should let the JJ stand in in case of your terrible trauma? I think it's a bit tricky question. Yes, uh, if uh, uh, the laceration is uh, partial, I think uh, four weeks is a good uh, time to, to keep uh, the JJ stand. If it's a total, and uh, it depends on, uh, uh, the, phys on the urologist's uh, uh, sense of time, I think uh, there is no need to keep a JJ stand more than two months after uh, such an operation. Thank you. Another question from the audience for three of you. Do you have any experience with robotic technique in repair of your trauma? Uh, 
if if you're doing the procedure robotically and you damage the ureter, I think there is enough evidence to repair the ureter in the same procedure, if the urologists have experience with the robot, to perform it with the same approach. And if you're going to repair it, let's say in three months time, probably if you're able to do it with the robot, it's safe because most of the techniques that I already mentioned in, during my presentation can be safely done using a robotic approach yes. if you're less skill, you are skilled enough. So I, will, I would go for a robotic approach for sure for a, for a ureteric repair, and that's what we do in our, in our hospital, in our practice. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sharma, what type of uh, reimplantation do you think is preferred, refluxing or anti-reflux? Uh, I, I would do just a normal reflux and repair. I don't do anything too fancy, but I do tunnel the ureter. So I suppose that is a form of anti-reflux. Mm -hmm. Great. And one more question. You were mentioning, uh, Dr. Campos, the psilodocin 8 milligrams preoperatively. It raised a bit of uh, interest in the audience. Can you elaborate a bit more? Do you think it should, it, it will go to our routine uh, uh, preoperative management. Sorry, you seen the the industry in green. Do Do you think it's going to to key, to be a routine procedure for us before surgery? The psilocin eight milligrams. Uh, I mean, I'm not, the the study is one of the few. You mentioned in your introduction that there are only quite a few randomized controlled trials in our field, and this is one of our new incorporations for the 2022 guidelines. So, and it's a, it's a small study, but they managed to prove that they ha they, there is benefit in using the psilocin H milligram for three days. But they, they, in the outcomes, they assess the damage performed using the insertion, using the, the actual sheet. So I'm not sure if, if, if you're doing um, another sort of ureteroscopy, not with uh, not using any 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 special introduction sheet there is any benefit on that but probably there is little harm in giving psilocin for three days because it's a safe mm -hmm. medication and probably the the side effects are going to be really small so i will go for it one more interesting question from the audience they say that in sleeve gastrectomy uh, they use nasogastric tube with a small light Along that glows and enables correct placement of the stapler. Do you, any one of you know about similar experience with ureteric uh, stenting that glows? Following with the that's something similar to using the retrograde in yes. the cyanine green. I mean, if you're doing any procedure, for instance, if you're doing a colectomy using the using the robotic approach uh, with the robotic plasma, it's really easy to change the light and, and to see for the endocyan in green. So if you have like a small catheter inside and, and you retrograde insert the, the green inside, uh, you're gonna see it as if you have a light inside because it's really bright and, and it's really easy to see it. I mean, and we're using it for, for when we were doing reimplantations in order to find the retroal stand, we are using the endocyan in green. But there is now evidence to using pre, like preventive, but in colorectal surgery. There is any other sort of any uh, of evidence of using this kind of dye in, in, in other surgeries. Thank you very much. So we are right on time. So thank you guys for beautiful talks and a very interesting discussion. Thank you for the audience. We had uh, almost 300 uh, attendees for this webinar. Thank you very much.